Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we'd look at taxable estate and specifically we're going to be looking at expenses, losses, and deductions. This topic is covered in a corporate income tax course, the CPA exam regulation section, enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,000 600 plus accounting auditing tax and finance lectures if you like my lectures please like them it doesn't cost you anything share them put them in playlist if they benefit you it means they may benefit other people so share the wealth and please connect with me on instagram on my website you will find additional resources such as multiple choice true false cpa questions cpa exercises that are quasi cpa simulations so if you're studying for your cpa exam or you want additional resources, I strongly suggest you check out my website. Let's start by reviewing the estate tax formula, which starts with the fair market value of gross estate. And this is what we talked about in the prior session. You can check the description, which is what we call this line one. Then we deduct from line one, we're gonna call line two, and it's not really one line, it's multiple lines, but on these lines, we're gonna have expenses, losses, and deductions. And in this session, we're gonna be focusing on this line, line two. The deductions the losses the expenses then line one minus line two will give us line three which is the taxable estate then we add any taxable gift which we already talked about gifts and taxable gift you could also look in the prior uh, session equal to the estate tax basis now we're gonna figure out what's our tax liability deduct any taxes that we paid prior in prior years post 1976 tax deduct the unified tax credit deduct any other tax credit then if the answer is still positive we have a tax due on estate tax and basically eventually we're going to work all this formula all this formula but the two most important line are line one and line two and the rest are computation and you will see later when we work an exercise that once you figure out line one and line two the rest kind of they fill in from prior knowledge or from other sources or you need to know how to compute the tax liability which we'll talk about this now when it comes to deductions we're going to focus a little bit more on the marital deductions but the first we want to look at losses and expenses what are some of expenses losses and and charity that can be deducted after the person passes away this is what we're going to be looking at so it's a list of things a list of laundry list so for for example for your exam at, at the university you would need to know what that list is what's included what's not for the cpa exam the same exact concept you want to know what's included what's not maybe you're better off knowing what's not included in those expenses because it's a list of you want to know because usually they ask you what's not for example funeral expenses generally speaking are included expenses incurred in administering the property once you pass away that's 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 included as an expense claims against the estate like any unpaid mortgage well you, you can deduct this expenses incurred in administrating community property community property means you and the other individual own it only deductible to the portion of the deceased spouse interest in the community that include what that include commissions to the executor the person that's going to be in charge of the estate attorney fees accountant fees court cost certain selling expenses when you want to sell the property you're going to incur expenses those are deductible deductible also property taxes accrued before the decedent's death so if you if you owe any property before you passed away then that's going to be deductible unpaid income taxes on income received by the decedent before they passed away same concept unpaid gift taxes so simply put if you owe taxes before you passed away you can deduct those taxes the decedent's unpaid pledge or subscription in favor of public charitable religious or educational organization is deductible to the extent that it would it would it would have constitute an allowable deduction had it been been made a bequest so simply put if the individual that passed away made made a pledge then that pledge is deductible as long as would have been deductible if the person deductible under taxes if the person basically either was alive or they passed away also if there's any casualty or, or theft incurred during the period when the estate is being settled okay now here here we're talking about casualty and theft losses but remember the rules are a little bit different what does that mean it means we don't have the the floor or the 100 dollar deduction so it's just know that casualty and and theft losses are deductible if those happen during the settle when the estate being settled charity counter charitable contribution if designated in the decedent's will if the decedents in their will said i would like to contribute five million dollars to a charity as long as that's included in the will that's deductible now of the 
executor who would like he or she would like to contribute this that's not that's not up to them it's not deductible they can if they can they can if they are allowed but they cannot deduct it from gross estate so simply put what i just did showed you what are some of the expenses and losses that are allowed from the gross estate Okay, because the more you want to deduct, the better off you are because you'll pay less taxes. Now we need to talk about the marital deduction because that's an important deduction. So simply put, the marital deduction, the purpose of it, the Congress says when, when, when someone passed away, if they're married, we really don't want to get involved between the husband and the wife. What's going to happen is we're going to allow what's called the marital deduction. So this way, the assets goes from the husband to the wife or from the wife to the husband with no tax consequences with no tax consequences so the marital deduction allows spouses to arrange their financial affair without federal gift or state gift consequences so when you transfer assets money whatever you have left in your gross estate to your spouse there's no really there's no effect on your federal gift tax or estate tax okay so asset can can pass between them without any immediate gift or estate tax liability and that's the purpose just to make the life of the person that passed away a little bit more easier with a deduction allowed to offset otherwise a taxable gift or an estate so what you do is you will include it then you will deduct it what's called it's called the marital deduction obviously if you pass away your asset goes from you to your spouse well it's going to be included in your gross estate in line one then in line two you will deduct it so it's, it will be offset it. so let's take a look at an example at the time of his death in the current year t owed an insurance owned, owned an insurance policy on his own life. The face amount is half a million with Ella, his wife, as a designated beneficiary. So if something happened to him, the half a million goes to his wife. T and Ella also owned a real estate worth 600000 as tenant by entirety. It means when one of them passes away, the other individual gets the property. T had furnished all the purchase price. It doesn't matter. If they are married, it's 50-50. As, as to these transferred, 500 the insurance proceeds as well as the as well as the uh, as well as the uh, half of the asset the insurance proceeds as well as half of the asset is included in the gross estate of t so if this is t if this is teo the let me just kind of write here this way we we, we can see what's going on if this is we're going to assume this is teo let me change the color so you can see this is Teo, and this is Ella. Okay, so the asset's gonna go eight hundred thousand. Why eight hundred thousand? The insurance policy and half of his half of his real estate. Okay, goes to Ella, and basically it's gonna be included in line one, that then, then deducted in line two. So eight hundred thousand plus eight hundred thousand minus. Now marital deduction when the property. Um, interest passing to the surviving spouse is subject to a mortgage when there's a mortgage against that property so so the asset is passed but there's a mortgage we're going to only count the net value of the interest after after reduction by the amount of the debt qualify for the marital deduction simply put if you transfer an asset and it has a loan what's really transferred is the net value of this asset in his will jacob leaves real estate with a fair market value of half a million to Rachel his wife if the real estate is subject to a mortgage of half of hundred thousand okay upon which Jacob is responsible the marital deduction is limited to four hundred thousand so why four hundred thousand the fair market value of the property minus the loan the one hundred thousand mortgage is deductible as an obligation of the decedent so the one hundred remember if you owed any money remember you can deduct that as well that it's not a marital deduction what really transfer is the net then we have something called Q tip or qualified termable interest property and we just want to kind of know what Q tip is when you think of Q tip think of this individual it doesn't it doesn't mean think of this individual uh, this is Mr. Hafner if you don't know who he is he's the founder of the Playboy and he had multiple wives so basically what happened is this I'm not saying that he used the Q-tip. I'm just saying when you have more than one marriage, what happened is this. Let's assume you uh, you married uh, your first wife and you had two kids from your first wife or three kids. Then you got divorced, you married a second time. Now, with the second marriage, you know, your new spouse, maybe she has two, three kids. Now, when you pass away, you, what you want to do is you want to keep some assets to, to, to your kids from the previous marriage. Now, if you leave the asset to your kids from the previous marriage, they're not subject to the marital deduction. 
because didn't go to your spouse, they went to your kids. So you can do, individuals can set up a Q-tip, which is a trust, and what they would do, they would allow the recent spouse, the second spouse, to enjoy the asset, to enjoy the asset, in a sense, be able to use the asset. But once they pass away, the asset goes to your kids. So simply put, if you pass it, so you have, picture, I'm, I'm just going to try to do this real quick. So you, you have uh, this, this individual, that's their first spouse, okay? That's their first spouse, and they have three kids. Now they get divorced. Now he's married to a second spouse. Really lousy. Okay, now this is his second spouse. Now, what you would do is you would pass the asset to your second spouse on the condition that once she passes away, the asset goes to the three kids from the first spouse. So this way, rather than paying the taxes now, you would defer the taxes for later. And this way, you also protect your second spouse that she can live off the asset, but she, there's nothing she can do with it or he can do with it until they passes away. Then it goes to, the, to what you wanted to do. So basically, it's a kind of deferring the tax until the, in a sense, second spouse. It doesn't have to be a second spouse situation. The reason I'm trying to explain this in a second spouse situation to make it easy for you to understand, and that's why I use Mr. Hafner as an example, because he is a well-known figure, and, and you know, his divorce uh, case lasted several years. Um, and I don't know if it's, re if it's done or not, but that's the whole point of it. So, Property that passes from one spouse to another by gift or at death and for which the transferee spouse has a qualifying income interest for life. So basically the asset goes from, from Mr. Hafner to his second spouse. Let's assume that's the case. And the spouse has a qualifying interest income for life. So if they have stocks and bonds, the spouse can, can get the stocks, can get the, can get the interest, can get the dividend and live off that. Okay. So the person is entitled for life to all the income from the property, payable at an annual or more frequent interval, whatever the arrangement is. No person has the power to appoint any part of the property to any person other than the surviving spouse during his or her life. So basically, that's that's the deal. No person has the power to appoint the property other than the spouse. Once you make this election, is irrevocable. If the election is made, okay, a transfer tax is imposed on the Q-tip, on the trust, when the surviving spouse dispose of it by gift so let's assume the 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 second spouse decided to give it a gift to the to the designated transferee to the to the kids from the first marriage or upon death okay and under those circumstances if the later transfer occurred during the survivor spouse's life which is a gift a gift tax apply measured at fair market value and if the spouse kept the asset until she passes away it's part of her estate part of her estate. So this is basically what's a Q-tip, qualified termable interest property, okay? An example with Clyde dies and provides in his will that certain asset fair market value of 2.1 million are to be transferred to a trust under which Lily, his wife, to receive income of the trust for her life with the remainder passes to her, to their children upon Lily's death. So what's happening here, Clyde doesn't want to transfer the asset to the kids now because he'll have to, it will have to be included in his estate that's one thing. And maybe he also wants to protect his wife in a sense that he wants the property to be under her control until she passes away. Presuming that all the preceding requirements are satisfied and Clyde's executor so elects the estate received a marital deduction of 2.1 million. So Lily dies when the trust assets are worth 6.4. The amount is included in her gross estate. Then it goes to the kids as Clyde wished before he died. So basically there's like a two, what you do is you're deferring the deferring the taxes for later. And let's take a look at a marital deduction, kind of a good example, uh, working example to kind of illustrate the concept. Hank and Wendy are married. Hank purchases survivor annuity. Wendy is the beneficiary. The fair market value is half a million. Hank and Wendy jointly own property with a fair market value of 600,000. Jointly means 50-50. Hank owns a property by himself for 100000 Hank owns a life insurance on his life, and Wendy is the beneficiary, the face value is 400000 Hank dies. Let's assume Hank passes his solely owned property to his children, which is only the 100000 and let's assume he passes everything 
to Wendy. It passes a solely property to Wendy. So let's see how it works, how the marital deduction works. So here we go. What's included in the gross estate of Hank? Well, the annuity he purchased for, that's he purchased himself. That's his. That it gets included. Then the jointly owned property, the six hundred thousand. What's going to happen with that? It's going to be split 50-50. It's a jointly joint property, 300,000 and 300,000. The 100,000 will be included in the gross estate of Hank and the life insurance. It's because it's his life insurance. Oh, Wendy is the beneficiary, but it's his, therefore it's included in his estate. So his gross estate is 1.3 million. Now what's going to happen is he's going to transfer things to his wife, to his spouse. So less the marital deduction. The annuity, 500,000, it's included here. Then it's deducted and transferred to Wendy. The 300,000 is included in the gross, at, gross, pro, gross estate. Then it's, then it's transferred to Wendy. It's deducted, then transferred to Wendy. This asset, he owned solely. He wants to keep for his kids directly. That's not marital deduction. It's going to be included in his gross estate. And the life insurance, the same thing. It's included, then deducted, and it goes to Wendy. What's going to happen is the taxable estate for Hank is only 100000 which is nothing. It's that don't have to worry about anything. Now, the total gross estate for Wendy after this transfer is 1 point, 1 point what's transferred to her. To, in total, now it's under her estate, $1.5 million. Now, let's assume B, uh, Hank transferred his solely property to solely property to Wendy, then his estate will be zero and Wendy will have 1.6 million, 1.6 million. We'll work another example when I do the CPA simulations, but this is basically an illustration of the marital deduction. Also, what we can include, uh, deduct is state taxes at that. Now, certain states and certain counties, they impose a death tax, basically, uh, if you're passing not all states, that's why it's, you know, I have uh, asterisk because it's not all of them. These taxes can be assessed at a marginal of almost 20%. Um, so if you pay the taxes, what can you do? You are allowed a deduction, a deduction against your taxable estate and inheritance taxes. So you pay them for the state or for the county, then you'll get a deduction. So the deduction is not to not to not to pay taxes twice basically the deduction for taxes paid to the state at the death mitigate the effect of subjecting property to multiple taxes payable at death so you paid you pay the taxes for the state you will get a deduction so that's another deduction so basically this is the formula that we started with at this point at this point we've covered uh, line one in the prior the, in the prior session, you could look at the description. In this session, we'll look at li line two. Then the remainder of this is basically, it's a computation, and we'll work a CPA simulation in the next session, illustrating this concept. So in the next session, I'll work a few exercises, kind of CPA simulation, to illustrate what we learned and reinforce and understand. Again, this topic oftentimes is not properly taught in college, or if it's taught in college, students don't pay attention. Then when they get to the CPA exam, well, you suffer. And this is why I can help you. So what I suggest you do, if you like my videos, please like them. If you want to visit my website for additional resources, don't hesitate to do so. You, you study for your CPA once. You want to use all your resources to succeed. This is a 20 to 30 year investment. Do it properly. Get the CPA behind you. I'm here to help you and study hard.